You're incredible. <laughs> Dad waited a moment to ensure he had their full attention before he closed his eyes and began. For what we're about to receive, we're truly grateful, he began. And for everything around us, we're truly proud. Thomas gave Janice's hand a gentle squeeze, a silent sign that he too had recognised the ridiculous ostentatiousness of what was supposed to have been a verse or two of sincerity. She opened her eyes and looked his way, and he rolled his eyes with a bowed head. And for the year ahead, Dad said, we promise to create opportunities so that others less fortunate than ourselves may benefit. Amen, Gareth said. Amen. Amen. All but two of them chorused. Jack Cartwright, how are things in Lincolnshire? Fantastic, mate. How are you? Very good. You're not originally from there, though, are you? I'm not, no. I'm an Essex boy, East London, Essex. Um, I know we spoke about this last time, but for anyone who's watching you for the first time, how did you end up in Lincolnshire? Uh, well, I went from London to Dubai. Spent 11 years in Dubai. Yeah, I was about to move to Montana when I met my wife, who wanted to move back to the UK. And, uh, I, yeah, I, I, I agreed, as long as it wasn't back to London. Um, right. So, yeah, I, yeah no, I, couldn't, I don't think I could do that again. I, I was looking for a little bit of peace and quiet, you know, like yeah. London's hectic. Uh, Dubai's hectic, so I was looking to kind of bring things down a, a few levels. Right, so you're in the Montana of the UK? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, things would have been very different. I would have been sitting on my uncle's porch of his ranch. Um, yeah, I don't know what I'd be doing. Not a lot, probably. There's not a lot out there. <laughs> uh, this is this is really nice. I think, it, you know, things have happened for a reason, right? This is really nice. Um, well, it's it's really. the perfect setting for the books, and you and I yeah. have already done eleven audio books in the Wild Fens murder mystery series, but this mm -hmm. one, A Winter of Blood, is the first in the DCI Cook murder mystery series. What makes this series different to the Wild Fens series? Uh, a slightly different style of writing. Yeah. Um, a smaller team. So very often with the Wild Fens, which is honestly, I, I love writing the Wild Fens, but there's um, there's seven or eight of them in the team, so you can always you've always got to get out. If if something needs to happen at a particular time and your characters are in the wrong place, yeah. you can just send someone else. Um, so with this one, it made it quite quite cool that it was a smaller team. It's only two of them to begin with. Um, and yeah, they have to do all the legwork themselves, uh, and it's lovely to start in afresh, you know. Yeah. Um, really different. So with the wild friends, there was uh, without spoiling it for people, there's a, a romance element, uh, very slightly, running throughout the series. Um, and with this series, I didn't want to do that again. So I created a kind of father daughter ish relationship. That you know, just as just as close, the bonds just as strong. Yeah. Um, but very different, very different dynamics, um, and that was really, yeah, really interesting to write. It's lovely. And set in Lincolnshire again, but a slightly different part of Lincolnshire to where the Wild Fens are set. Only very slightly. Yep. In fact, they probably encroach on Freya and Ben's territory a little. Uh, this one was set in Hayenson and uh, Brenston Booths, which is just, I don't know, two minutes that way. Um, uh, yeah, and Freya and Ben are probably set like two minutes that way. <laughs> right. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's very close, but I love I love the area, and there's so many lovely places. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's just too many places. I'd, I'd be writing a, writing a book until I, I'm 90, to try and cover off all the places I like about Lincolnshire. What I liked about it, because, you know, I've got favourite characters from the Wild Fen series, and I was glad that one of them made a return, which is the pathologist, uh, the Welsh, the crazy Welsh pathologist. And I was really well, pleased that she she makes an appearance in this one as well, because, you know, the, she's the pathologist for the region. So, you know, that makes sense. 
Um, were you tempted yeah. to bring many of the others back in as well? Yeah, this is the thing. So, yeah, it's a new series. It's based out of a different police station. Um, but it's almost like in sci-fi, you probably know, you, there's a authors create worlds and actually multiple authors write in the same world, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so then you, one author can be writing and one of the little tertiary like characters on the side might be from somebody else's book. And it's just a little nod of like appreciation, you know? Um, but realistically, the, the books that I'm writing, they, they are, yeah, they're writing in, uh, I'm writing in a world. It's Lincolnshire. It isn't London. We're not going to have, I don't know, 10 or 20 forensic pathologists in Lincolnshire, right? Mm -hmm. We're going to have one or two. And um, when you've met Dr. Pippa Bell, I mean, you don't need any more. <laughs> right? um, she's, she's brilliant. And I, I love writing her. And I, I just thought if I keep her in it, um, my existing audience, when they read the book, it's just a nice little, that warm little fuzzy moment. Someone they recognize, right? So only yeah. by a new character, new style, new story, um, and just a little bit of warmth coming from Pippa. Yeah, because she's, she's for the characters in the Wild Fens book, for the two main characters in that, Pippa's can be hard, Pippa can be hard work, particularly for one of them in, in particular. But it was interesting to see how different characters reacted yeah. to her. You know, and yeah. it almost made her character even stronger because now you've got because it's all about the reactions, you know. And uh, to see two other characters working with her as well, it, it was just great. Let's talk about the main two characters because they're very different from Ben and Freya in the Wild Fens series. By the way, if you love the Wild Fens series, you'll love this series as just as much. It's great. Oh well judging by the first book, but I'm sure the rest of them are going to be great too. Let's talk about the characters then. First of all, DCI Cook. He's a complex guy with a real backstory, isn't he? Yeah, I mean, he's got to have a backstory, isn't he? Um, yeah. But, you know, I, what I didn't... There's so many cliches in writing, and everything's been done. I'm never going to be the first one to do a particular trope or, you know, character traits. Um but I, I do like to give somebody something fresh as much as I can. So very often you'll find the protagonist is strong, handsome, chiseled. You know, uh, I, I, I just did the, the opposite, the polar opposite of what people were looking for. And I kind of, and I kind of think that helps people connect. It certainly helped me connect to them. So actually, the the main character Charles Cook is based on Jim Broadbent. But a Scottish Jim Broadbent. Yes. Yeah. In my head. Yeah. That's uh, the age, um, the the body language. It's kind of, that's that's who's in my head. Just like with Wild Friends, it's Gillian Anderson when I write Freya. Yeah. Yeah. You have to, I, I have find it's easier to have somebody in my head. Um, yeah. So, yeah. It's Jim Brent, Jim Paul Brent with a um, Scottish accent, but yeah, he's great. So and and Devon as well, um, his sidekick DS yeah. uh, DC Devon. She, they're both nerds. They're both social outcasts for yes. their own. Um, I won't won't spoil the reason why. No, we can't. No spoilers here. No, no. Uh, but that's that. That's just it. They're they're not popular people. Yeah. Right. They're not. They're not horrible people. But they're they're the, the bullied, you know. Yes, well, they're at the lowest end of the social ladder, if you like. I mean, he might be a DCI, but socially, they're both at the very bottom of that ladder. They're yeah, they're, they're not they're cool. Got, they are misfits, aren't they? Really, yeah. Not part of the cool club, are they? Um, yeah. And that's that's just it. So yeah, they have to they have to do some work, and you know, they don't want to be cool. It's not like they're trying to be cool, but over over the Next few books, who knows? They might become people. Might start wanting to work with them, right? Yeah. What I liked about it was DCI Cook is closer to the end of his career than the beginning, but Devon is closer to the beginning. Was that deliberate so that you could get yeah. that kind of father father daughter uh, relationship going there? Yeah, I was saying I wanted to eliminate any chance of romance. Um, oh, I see. Right. Oh, that was the reason. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Because yeah, because 
Because oh, readers and listeners are going to try and think that, yeah, but they're not, that you wanted to take that distraction away. Yeah. Yeah. And in fact, um, Devon isn't too far, too much older than Cook's daughters. So, right. Right. So that's, um, I don't know, it all plays together. It's hard to say without, without spoiling anything, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's all no, a, we're not going to spoil it. Right. Yeah. And it's just you know, taking them as far apart as I can. I mean, so there's no chance of a, a relationship happening. But you know what? He's got a wealth, wealth of experience to, to hand down. So she's in a really good position. And he's yeah. in a really good position. He's going to end his career with someone who actually likes him for the first time, <laughs> actually admires him. But can yeah. kind of translate all of that youth, all the you know, all the modern speak, right? The way people yeah. talk when they're when they're young, um, translate all that young stuff to him. So yeah, yeah, it, it, they kind of help each other out there. It's not just a one way kind of one way street here. They're, they're yeah. both together, and they're, it's actually a really good kind of dynamic between them. Yeah, she can absorb his wisdom and he can absorb her energy. Yeah. And uh yeah, that's a it's a great way to do it. And the the yeah. story the story is there's a lot of parallels between this and you mentioned it to me at the beginning so this isn't my observation, but you mentioned this to me when we started working on the the audiobook is that there are parallels here between this and Charles Dickens a Christmas carol and it is actually set at Christmas. Yeah. Yes. Was yeah. that something you wanted to do, or was that something that evolved as you were doing the story? No, no, that's something I wanted to do. That was that was like the the crux of the story. Yes, and it was a real challenge to try and get that across, but not make it look like I've ripped off a Christmas Carol. Oh, don't don't get me wrong, <laughs> you've, you've read it. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way I've ripped the story off. No way, no. It's, Certain points within the Christmas Carol and a certain characters' traits that yes. um, a winter of blood hits. Yes, right. But there's certain things that, are, and it's just a nod of appreciation to to Dickens. I mean, it, it's the best writer that ever lived, right? Yeah. So, um, if I can, if I can do something that just nods to that story, which is fantastic, yeah. um, you know, well, that story would be still be being told in three, four hundred years time, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, a winter of blood might not. <laughs> it might do. I think it will. <laughs> I, I hope they're listening to it though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's, um, yeah, so it's just a, a real big nod of appreciation and kind of just some, again, it's those points that make people sit back and that familiarity and that, that little warm fuzzy moment. Oh, yeah, I see. Right? Yeah. But you haven't actually in you haven't gone too far in explaining that to the listener or the reader the only no. the only real hint is that there is a company involved there's a family business in the story and once again no spoilers i don't want to say too much there is a family business at the center of this story and you've called them dickens yeah yeah, yeah. he's called charles right the detective is charles good yeah 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 so you've yeah. got that going on there I've come now on. you you write <laughs> You write fiction set yeah. in real places in Lincolnshire. Yeah. But without any real life human being or any business thinking you're writing about them. How hard is that? Because you've got to write what you know and you've got to put familiar places in so that people who are from that area or visited that area know, you know, where you're on about. But yeah. how do you how do you make that differentiate without risking uh, businesses going like that sounds like that Dickens business you know who that is well, how do you keep yourself safe because you live there as well so if you got that wrong it would go horribly yeah. wrong for you uh, I haven't been uh, lynched yet so <laughs> I, I do say at the back of the books as well so I if I find a nice place so for example a couple of weeks ago, we went out for a meal with a couple from the village. We went into Woodall Spa, which is just a couple of miles away. Um, went to a really nice tapas bar, had a fantastic meal. And when we left, I crept back in and just spoke to the owner and said, please let me use your um, your restaurant in my books. And 
I will only shine the positive light on local businesses. Yeah. Oh, uh, I see. So you do occasionally use real local businesses, but stay positive to them. A hundred percent. If there's, right. yeah, if, there's, if I do anything bad or shine any negative light on any business, then I'll make that business up. It'll right. be a, a pub. It might be a shop. I mean, it could be anything. Um, in this case, yeah, it could be a, a couple of businesses I've had to make up. Right. <laughs> Just people say, no, I don't want to shine any poor light on, on any businesses. I, I want Lincolnshire to, you know, grow and be kind of affluent, right? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, but I do really enjoy going in. And so the book I'm writing now, um, funny enough, they go to a tapas bar. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what it's all about. And obviously I, I d- got a, an email trail with the owners as well to say, like, they don't mind me using their restaurant in the books. Um, when the book comes out, I'll drop a few copies into them. And I like to do that. I did it with the Petwood Hotel in Woodall Spa. Um, yeah. So just lo- really good local businesses that I really, really enjoy. I just shine them in a positive light. It's great because Lincolnshire itself becomes almost another character in the book. You know, it's oh, more it than just, just the backdrop. Yeah, yeah, it's the protagonist and it's the antagonist, right? Sometimes yeah. the landscape works against them. Yeah. It's, yeah. It can places that are real i mean don't get me wrong it's not it's not mountainous but there are some places in lincolnshire that i mean it's fairly flat but when that wind kicks up and the storms come in there's no hiding from it it, it can be <laughs> a real wild and barren place right some sometimes it's safer to be on a mountain i'd imagine because you can you got something to hide behind uh, when out there sometimes walking a dog i feel like i'm just gonna be blown off yeah yeah. Oh, it lends itself to the cover art as well. Who does the cover art, by the way? Because they're so atmospheric. Yeah, uh, there's this really good guy called uh, Jack Cartwright. <laughs> what? You do the cover art? Yeah, yeah. I, take, I never I knew take... that. How did I not know that? <laughs> I take a, I take a lot of photos as well. So there's my camera. Um, so I'll go out to wherever I'm writing and find some find something that's going to work for my cover. So I do the designing, so I know what kind of photo is going to fit. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I, that's that's how it's done. I mean, I was a photographer for, for years before I, or actually when I first started writing, I was still a photographer. So, yeah, I, I know all the editing tools and Photoshop and bits and pieces, so, yeah. Wow. Well, that's blown me away because uh, they look so yeah. good. Yeah. Oh, thank you. And I, I had no idea it was you, and I, I'm glad I found out that. Uh, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, no, that is a positive. <laughs> no, no doubt about it. No, it really is. And <laughs> and what I like about this book and all of the Wild Fens books as well are the multiple plot twists because you read it, or I read it, and I go, okay, all right, so that's what's going on there. That's that's who did it or they've got some involvement in it. And then a couple of chapters later, you're going, oh, wait a minute. Do you have to map those out ahead of time? Because they get quite complicated, usually in the final third of the books. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a big dent on my desk about here. Um, yeah. That's my sh- shaped to my forehead. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's uh, it can get quite complicated. I I, I don't always write in the same manner. So right. sometimes sometimes I've got a, a like a winter of blood. The opening few chapters, or I'd say which ones, but the opening few chapters I've been thinking about for ages, and I was trying to fit them into story with Freya and Ben, but it just it was too far away from Freya and Ben's style, if you like, and their type of book. So that's where the new series comes from. Um, and if I've got the beginning, sometimes I just write the first act. Now I write the first act, characters just come into my mind as I'm, as I'm writing, I get to the, fir- the end of the first act. And I can be like, right. So I've got five potential suspects. <laughs> Which one could it be? And sometimes I can choose. And sometimes I just carry on writing right the way up to the very end. Like in the case of A Winter of Blood, 
right the way up. I think there's 61 chapters, is there? Or it's about that, so, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I probably got up to about chapter 54, 53 or 54 before I kind of settled on, because I knew it could go one of a number of ways. And then I had to make my decision. And actually, I asked my editor. I got I had to read it uh, and a couple of others to read read the book and tell me who they thought it was. Yeah. And then, funnily enough, two of the three said the same person, so it wasn't going to be them. <laughs> Great. And yeah. I just think, if I know who it is, then the reader's not going to know who it is, right? Yeah, they might yeah. guess. But yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and then it's a case of going back and just making that word, planting those little seeds, so that when the reader or the listener does find out who it is, they suddenly remember those little tiny details. And, ah, of course, right? Which is what we all love. That's one of the things people love about murder mysteries and procedures. Yeah. So then do you go back and then rewrite previous bits to make the end fit? Is that what you do? Yeah, 100%. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Progress. If I if I stopped and thought about everything and tried to make it work the first time round of writing, I I wouldn't have had all these. You know, it did yeah. take so long. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And you'd get bogged down in detail as well. You've got to get it out there. You've got to get the story unfolding and moving along. Yeah, you can then yeah, fix up the details later. And freedom. So yeah. I'm not coming up with the dialogue half the time. Most of the time especially people like Gillespie and Cruz, you know, they've got a mind, literally got a mind of their own. Yeah. Um, because like things just, the things they say, like I'm laughing at what they're saying. Oh. And it's, it's such a strange thing, but to, to get into that kind of flow state, yeah. you just have to let it go. And then yeah. again, sometimes in contrast to the writing, the first act or whatever, sometimes I only know how it's going to end. Um, and it's just a case of trying to, trying to get there that could be quite challenging yeah um there's yeah. a there's a lovely bit in i think it was book 11 of the wild fens with gillespie and cruz and uh i forget who gillespie was talking about and he says oh he's a bit of a wee bastard and he says <laughs> and cruz says oh he's little is he no 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 he says you are a wee bastard he is a <laughs> bastard it's just <laughs> <laughs> brilliant it, it 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 really helps define the two characters as well it is as well as it being a funny the dialogue being so great between the two of them it was it was wonderful to record it was so much fun um, well, they are, I, I, I probably will never do a spin-off but if i did it would have to be gillespie <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's really good so tell me yeah. about then a typical day as a writer for you how much time do you spend with your head down do you have a certain number of words or pages that you have to do every day i mean what's a typical day look like because you've got a life as well you know so you've got to work that into it <laughs> um i try to get a couple of chapters done per day right um, uh, often i'll hit that by lunchtime uh, what time will you start? That all depends on my daughter. Okay. Who's three. Three in February. Yeah, so that, that all depends on, on her and how early she's decided to wake up or how long she's decided to sleep in. You know, it's a yeah. curveball for many children, isn't it? So right. every day, every morning is different. If I can work and I can get started, I can get 500 words or so in before she's gone to preschool. Yeah. Um, and then that, start, that starts me off in a good day. I go to the gym um, three mornings a week now. Yeah. Um, not enough, but needs, you know, got to start somewhere. Yeah. Um, and, and then just get stuck in with the writing. But I tend to know, even though even if I haven't planned the book throughout, I tend to know what my next couple of chapters are going to be. So I don't come down or I don't come home from the gym, have a shower, then sit down and look at a blank sheet of paper. I, I've always known the next two or three chapters are going to happen. Um, sometimes I know a lot more, like next 10, 20 chapters. Sometimes it's just a handful. As long as there's something there for me to work with, I can just sit down and get going. Yeah, um, and you'll do that up until lunch, two chapters, and then what? Yeah, so, sometimes. And then sometimes I'll get more in. Sometimes there's things to do, you know, like life does get in the way. Um, 
So then I'll sit there in the evening and while my wife watches TV, I'll just fire out another chapter. And this is all, this is all um, first draft stuff. So I know it hasn't got to be perfect. What I need to do is get the story down, get the, get the key points in. And then when I go back over it, I can then color it in and I can um, structure sentences a little bit better. You know, I just want to get the story out. I want to get that flow going. And that's, I think that's the real key. And how many drafts will you do before you're happy with the book? Um, it's on a chapter by chapter basis, if I'm honest. Yeah. Uh, at, least, at least two drafts of the entire book. However, some chapters can have multiple renditions. Mm-hmm. Just, just because, you know, you, I like a chapter to finish on, not a cliffhanger, but a little bit of a teaser. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Just something so, oh, and then they all say goodbye. Like, you know, like, end of the chapter. Brilliant. That's, you know, you got someone's laying in bed, they're really into the story, and their eyes are telling them, oh, come on, just go to sleep. And then you you got you to leave them with this little line that really makes them doubt whether they need to put that book down. Or, or carry on, right? Um, that's that's part of it. I think that's part of writing. That's what keeps the pace going as well throughout the stories. Yeah, but yeah. Even even on the the tamer moments of a story, they maybe they're in the mortuary. You know, maybe it's maybe it's quiet and everyone's a bit sullen. If you can finish on finish the chapter on something a little bit powerful, something a little bit thoughtful, yeah. or something. A, teaser there's a good chance that you're going to keep that pace going and someone will turn a page right one more chapter right (laughs) yeah and it works well for audiobooks as well it's like exactly the same thing people are going to be listening and going i'll just listen to the end of this chapter and then oh wait what you know make them listen to another one yeah exactly the same that's you know there are the overlaps between the written book and the, the audio book are definitely in there. And it is all in the writing. It is all absolutely in the writing. So talking of writing, then you mentioned you're working on the next book. What is next? Is it another DCI Cook murder mystery or is it a Wild Fens one that, that's next for you? Both. Uh, so oh. I'm, I'm just over halfway through the 12th book of Wild Fens. So I'm hoping that, looking for that to come out February or March. Right. Um, I want to be finished by the time everyone goes back to work. Like, for example, my editor goes back to work. I want her to go first day back at work. Ah, here's a manuscript. Yeah. So it usually takes, it takes about um, a month backwards and forwards um, editing. So yeah. she'll do, she'll do a, um, a first read through and come back with comments like, this doesn't make sense, you know, or you're contradicting yourself. And, and uh, you said his name was Dave earlier, and now you're calling him Stuart, which is a classic <laughs> me. I get halfway through a book and think of a new name for someone, and I don't catch all the previous iterations. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and then, so I'll make all the suggested changes to just to keep the, the story going well. And then for, after that, she'll do a, a proof edit. Then he'll go to a proofreader, and then I've got a whole bunch of people who I give the book to for free and um they will read it and i review it um so it goes has to go through a good two month of editing and proofreading before it comes out so i want to get it to my editor beginning of january so i can get it out in the march right so that the next one that will come out from jack cartwright will be book 12 of wild fens and then the one after that will be book two of dci murder mystery dci cook Yep, um, well, that's already that's up for pre-order now. Actually, they're both up for pre-order now. They're doing really well. Um, right, great. Really. And then in the summer, we'll see the third series, which will be my last series for a while. I and these are the these are the three series that will all they all live in the same world, different detectives, and um, they cover uh, nearly every part of Lincolnshire, which is nice the, one. A third series. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. going to be great. All right. Well, the one yeah. that's out now, um, it's just out. If you're watching this before Christmas, um, 
It's uh, it's out now. It'd be, make a wonderful Christmas gift. Either the actual book, the ebook, or the audio book. A nice audio book download. Or if you've got time off and you want to relax and you want a bit of, it's got a Christmassy vibe to it. Even though it's a murder mystery, so there's some heavy stuff in there too. It's got everything for you. It's uh, it's a winter of blood. In the description, if you're watching this on YouTube, in the description there's a link there to Amazon, so you can get it from there. And uh, Jack Cartwright, thank you so much. Continued success. Yeah. And thanks once again for choosing me as your narrator. I loved it. It's great. Well, really no problem at all. Thank you very much, sir.